Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Olavo Amaral from uh, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, and uh, I thank you, Tracy, for the invitation. And uh, I suppose I'm here because of the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative. Uh, so, like, uh, of course, you, uh, when I first got the invitation, you, you you were supposed to like talk about a published study. I don't think I have a published replication study, actually. But I do have a very long-running uh, replication project, which is the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative. Uh, I've been ahead of this for the last five years. Uh, it is a multi-center replication of published experiments from uh, Brazilian biomedical articles using a set of particular methods, which are the MTT assay, uh, RT-PCR, and the elevated plasmase. Uh, it's a very large multi-center consortia. We got uh, data from 58 labs. That's almost 200 researchers. Uh, and we're pretty much close to finishing. We uh, The experiments are all finished. We actually managed to complete some something for 143 experiments. I think 110 of them will be valid. So uh, not, I mean, not the 180 we expected, but still good enough. And every experiment gets replicated in, in three different labs. Of course, we missed some, but, uh, and we're about to start analysis and the results are due until the end of the year. But like much of my talk will be based on this experience, which is the experience I have, uh, which is trying to do a multi-center replication of uh, bench biomedical science. Uh, why we got into this? Because actually not a lot of people do it. So like systematic replications in basic biomedical science is still very rare. I think we're kind of like the largest uh, ever performed perhaps. Uh, and perhaps because you're frequently seen as boring and uh, undervalued. I mean, that's kind of like the textbook view of it. And I probably would not agree with it. I mean, uh, if you are into meta research, you might know that like there have been very uh, influent uh, replication studies uh, lately uh, in many different fields. And I think this have been important, very much, very important in terms of like establishing uh, the the actual existence of a reproducibility problem and, and trying to quantify this, but also have been very interesting in terms of like raising uh, interesting questions that of what exactly counts as a replication that really like cut deep into the philosophy of science and 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 I think that's worth uh, talking about and worth thinking about because that makes replications very much not non trivial. Uh, I don't think I have to talk a lot about the importance part. I think if you're into this, watching these presentations, I think you probably realize why replicates are important. We do have a reproducibility problem that's ultimately a reliability problem as well. Like we we have to to replicate things in order to know what to trust uh, in science, in any field of science, uh, of experimental science at least. So I think I'll move more into the philosophy part of it, and 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 really uh, my my main point is actually actually performing a replication is far from obvious. I mean, it might look simple. You just follow everything that's in the methods and see what comes out. Uh, but that's not really how it works. And, and and you do have to actually ask a lot of questions up front because you, before you start, because it's just like not following a recipe. As, as cooking is not, uh, I think, the, the, the same logic holds. Uh, again, I'll be basing very much uh, on the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative, but also making uh, some mentions to other replication projects. Uh, particularly the Reproducibility Project Cancer Biology, which has been an inspiration for us. And I think this up to now, uh, the largest attempt of like to try to systematically replicate a lot of studies within uh, basic uh, biomedical science. Uh, and of course, the first question is actually deciding what to replicate. I mean, of course, uh, replications take time and effort and money, and you can't really repeat everything. So what's really worth the effort? I think it's, uh, I mean, for any project, I think it's worth asking, but uh, definitely for an experimental project. And I think there are multiple uh, answers here, and that really depends on why you're doing your applications. I think there are different reasons to do replication study. Uh, the most obvious one is because it's important to know whether these results are actually valid and I want to replicate because I think this is important. I think that goes for many, uh, most perhaps replications. But again, there's other reasons. You might want to extend on this work and build on previous works, but you have to know whether this actually works in my hands. And you can do it for meta science purposes, right? I mean, you can do it to establish the reproducibility rate in the given field of, of, of science, a given region, a given institution, uh, I mean, as a form of quality control. And you can do it for training purposes as well. I mean, many people have, have done, have argued for the case that actually a very good way to actually get people into experimental research is to having them repeat something. Uh, and actually that also builds into the scientific record. 
And of course, the answer of what to replicate is not the same here. Uh, if you're doing it for the sake of the results, because I think this is a finding I want to have confirmed, you probably want to pick something that you think is important and worth confirming, or maybe very controversial, but like you wouldn't be repeating something if you think this is not particularly relevant. Uh, but that not that's not necessarily the case for if you're doing it for meta science purposes. Like here, you don't really want to be looking at what you think is important or what you think is is relevant or controversial. You want to be looking at something that's representative of something, right? And and we wanted to be representative of Brazilian science as a whole. So uh, in in the initiative, we actually, we actually took a, like a random sample of uh, many articles in Life Sciences Journal with Brazilian authors. And we just did, did full text mining for the methods in terms of being just like as random as possible. Of course, you can, you can never be really random because you can only replicate what you actually have the expertise to do. So it's a bit of a quasi random sample. It's we try to be random. We, we eventually select what was simple enough, cheap enough, and like had the same methods we were able to do. Uh, so it's, it's somewhat of a quasi random sample, but it's as representative as we could get. And of course, if you want to do it for training purposes, you want to find something that's easy enough to do. I mean, you don't want to, to get uh, people who are just beginning in science to try to replicate awfully diff diff difficult stuff. But of course, you also want to add ideally to the scientific record. So if you can pick something that's that's important as well, I think it's worth it. Uh, the second question is really how close do you want to replicate uh, the original findings? And that might sound obvious, uh, but it's not. But, but again, if you look, look at the textbook version of what people say about replications, they usually argue that there are, in psychology especially, that there are direct and conceptual replications. So like direct replications try to do the same thing. Conceptual replications change this and this and this in order to see whether the finding holds in other conditions, whether it's generalizable. Uh, you read this in a lot of places, but uh, to me, it's, it's really a false dichotomy because uh, you, you can never be direct, right? I mean, you can never replicate exactly the same thing, uh, if only because it's a different person in a different time, in a different place doing it. And of course, you're not repeating the exact same conditions. And that's fine, because if you're repeating the exact same conditions, you get the exact same result, and that's actually not informative. So actually, what's informative in, in, in replication is really what, what changes. Uh, and and uh, you only add knowledge if there's something different. That said, I mean, what you want to add is different varies a lot and that's actually a continuum and it's not like direct versus conceptual there's uh, uh, a, 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 a a a a crescendum of, of, of differences and you can get further away and the further away you get from the original finding the less informative your application is of that as well but of course it's more conceptual so it, it, it's more informative about generalizability it perhaps is less informative of of, of that very specific condition and uh, it's really up to you how much you want to diverge. Uh, and, and uh, well, it's not completely up to you because some things will always diverge and you can either add something extra or not. And of course, uh, what counts as a replication? Uh, how far do you want to go? You, can you go before this actually becomes something else? Uh, it's inevitably really, really a subjective call. If you want to go by this definition of replication, replication is something that actually tells you something about how reliable is the original finding. Of course, the further away you are, uh, the less, uh, I mean, the more the more possible it is that uh, your your results are different because of some protocol deviation. Uh, but really, like the the point where this does not say something about the original finding is really uh, in 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 the eye of the beholder. And uh, I guess this is important because really, uh, you 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 might you might want to engage people in 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 making this subjective decision i mean does this actually count as a replication i mean you can you can get to decide alone and that's fine i mean that's not wrong but of course like some people might disagree and they say no you change this and this and this is the protocol and this just is, makes it i mean it does not make it a valid replication anymore so you might want to engage some other people either the original authors or perhaps other researchers and of course the original authors might be seen as as, as perhaps the people who have the most mo the, the the most to say about this topic so people usually uh will see engaging the original authors making contact trying to uh, figure out if the protocol really is valid to replicate the study is typically good practice but you have to consider that like you might just not get help or not get an email response uh, this is from the cancer biology project uh, almost half of the of the authors did not help at all 
either because they did not answer or because they just didn't want didn't want to get info involved. Some were extremely helpful, but of course, this very variable. Uh, in our experience, we we actually contacted people after we started, so like we're asking for protocol details, but just for comparison, we did not use the author's input in the beginning. Uh, we got the mail rips, but like only seventeen out of fifty nine. Uh, people actually provided the protocol details we wanted. So that's actually a small percentage. And perhaps anticipating that, we actually uh, decided up front that we did not want to engage the authors in protocol development. We and, and for meta research purposes, that's probably okay. Because I mean, uh, we're actually, you're measuring something different. I mean, you can measure how replicable something is with a lot of help from the original authors versus how replicable is the literature just based on the article. I think both questions are actually uh, worth answering, and we we went for the second one. So uh, we did not engage the original authors because we just we actually wanted to see how much we can replicate based on what's published. But we did we did try to engage more than one person in developing the protocol. So the labs developed protocols. We evaluated the protocols as a coordinating team and actually sent them out for internal peer review by another lab who worked with the same method and was not doing the same experiment to say, okay, do you think this replication is okay? Is anything here uh, deviating too much or or, 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 or or not conforming to to best practice? So we try to get people engaged to 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 avoid the, I mean, to, to, to make the subjective call a little bit more, more democratic, even though we're not contacting the others. Uh, if you're doing it for the finance, I'll say, try, trying to contact the others is probably a, a, a good practice and should probably be what you're, you're trying to do, but you must realize you're frequently not getting that that help, uh, but again, I think this uh, this is another question. Like, when do you do this? And 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 really, I think uh, this one is an easy one. I mean, no matter who you're engaging, you should definitely do it before you have the results, and you should ideally do it before you start the experiment. I mean, you want to get uh, consensus, or at least try to get consensus on these protocols issues uh, uh, before you start, because afterwards it's, it's, it's very hard for people to disagree. And if you do it, if you call the authors after looking at the results, say, okay, I did not replicate the results. It's very easy to say for them to, to look at this. And if you, you, you don't get the same results, you, they never think the replication is valid because of this and this and this a change. Although they might have not, might, might not have the opinion when you start out. So it's really, it's really worth doing, it, doing this when you start. Uh, and really when to argue about a replication is really, uh, ideally when you start and, and if you're engaging the original authors you definitely want to call them up before starting and uh, i think the, the again the cancer biology project this did, did this in the register report format so they did submit every protocol uh to eli for, for publication before they started and they actually got uh, whenever possible they got one of the authors to be one of the reviewers so like here they actually were engaged in the in a formal peer review process and of course uh if they the, the, if the paper passed through peer review, then it means that some one of the authors at least think this, thinks that this is actually a valid replication protocol, and will kind of be forced to stick to it uh, when you finish and you have the results. Not it didn't always happen. If you talk to Tim Arantos, like some people just change their minds after they saw the results. But uh, I think this this tries to keep tries to keep people honest. If you're into some really controversial subject, you can actually go to extremes over it. It's a very interesting paper. Uh, came out uh, in the beginning of the year. It's the Transparent Sci Project. Uh, so these guys were trying to replicate some studies on precognition, on the idea that you can actually tell the future, which is a very controversial paper that came out in, in the psychology literature by a well-known author, uh, Daryl Bem, uh, about uh, 12 years ago. This Most people did not believe this, but some people are, are still proponents of the idea that the, the actual results are valid and believe the, uh, the original results. So, And of course, this is a hot topic, so and, and people are very... Uh, emotional about it. So they actually got uh, 29 people, uh, half from each side of the controversy, uh, got some, to some kind of consensus protocol that like all 29 people considered, okay, this is a, an okay experiment to try to replicate the original findings. Went to very, ex I mean, extreme extremes in terms of like making the process transparent, like, di like data was just like transmitted directly to a server uh, that was uh, overseen by, by, by many. So like, uh, just like making sure like nobody could cheat here. Uh, you may argue, I mean, and this is actually very hard to do. I mean, it took a lot of work, right? And you may argue that this is like a complete waste of resources to try to replicate this, something that has a very, very, very low uh, a priori possibility of being true uh, by physical reasons of how time flows. But uh, I think, again, I think it's important that science can do this. I think it's very worth uh, having this kind of thing for 
for extreme cases where you you you, you really have a, a big controversy, I think it's, it's important to, and, and and again, I think it, this is very interesting to read because uh, I think this uh, you rarely get to this extreme case, but you want to have some kind of consensus, and this just shows how far you can go. Uh, we didn't go that far. We did not engage the registrars, but we did try to get our labs to. Uh, we pre-registered all our protocols. So, like, we tried to have all the labs, we had all the labs to specify their methodological details in advance. And we did ask for a lot more than people normally ask. In particular, we asked for people to specify their validity criteria. So, like, what do you think is, uh, what, what are the criteria to say that this experiment is valid? Because, of course, I mean, you can, you can end with different results because the results are different, but you can also end with different results because the method didn't work in my hands. And actually this does not say something about the original findings. So you actually have to be able to tell your negative results or your or your contradictory results uh, con considering the, the original finding and actually to tell those apart from like methodological failures, like, okay, this is not really good enough to make a call uh, on the original result. And uh, we tried to have people pre-specify that. That turned out to be very hard uh, for, for biomedical researchers. People are not very used to have uh, quite like specific criteria for when to include the experiment and, okay, this experiment is valid. Uh, the positive control is working. The negative controls are working. This can be included in the analysis versus, no, this has something that makes me trust it a bit less. People had a very hard time specifying this in advance. Sometimes they specified super strict criteria that they eventually broke because it turned out to be uh, unbearable for them. So uh, I, I think this is harder than we thought when we started out, but I think it's an interesting attempt at least. Uh, and of course, uh, no matter, even if you go for a, like the, the most direct replication possible, I think it's important to realize that you still have to make choices on, 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 on some, because you can never truly, truly, truly be completely faithful to the original protocol. There's a lot of issues that come up, which require choices to be made and these choices again require subjective uh, judgments and they require uh, domain expertise in the field because some adaptations will be inevitable and not only the place and time but sometimes you have different equipment and for, for you, you cannot buy uh, a big machine just because these guys use this brand and not this brand you might have different reagents because uh, the originals are not available anymore they yeah the, the, the company doesn't exist or whatever uh, or this yeah uh you can have animals from different sources, most likely you will. I mean, you're not importing your animals for, from Germany just for, for the sake of doing replication from Brazil. Uh, and uh, you may, uh, researchers probably have different expertise and will be able to do different things. And sometimes they, they have to change some, some stuff because this is how I know it. I, I know how to do it this way and not that way, or I have the equipment to do it this way and not that, not that way. And of course, if you're changing things and you'll always be changing some, some of these things, you again, you have to decide whether these changes are okay if they still hold, make a valid replication versus okay, no, this completely disfigures the original protocol. And you also have to ensure that whatever you, whatever method you're using, that's still reliable and you can still trust in it, right? And uh, on top of that, uh, you usually have poor reporting of methods. And even if you ask for the for the original authors for help, you still have are very likely to have to decide on many issues that are not well described. And perhaps even if, again, even if we may, it's not even described, the, the authors might not know how they did it originally. If you looked at the cancer biology project, uh, all, all, all experiments in the project needed some kind of protocol verification, ranges from few to extreme, but there's no uh, a protocol that could no experiment that could be conduced exactly just with what was uh, in the in, in the paper. Uh, there's always missing information. Uh, that's definitely our experience as well. I mean, you frequently see some stuff like bulb C mice were housed in pathogen free conditions and fed a diet of food and water, and that's all you know about the animals. You don't know the age, you don't know the sex, you don't know the weight. Uh, and then, of course, what do you do uh, if you're not contacting the authors as, as, as we did not? You have uh, our option is just like to have each lab uh, fill this in uh, the best they can, like do this. I mean, do this in the most appropriate way. Do this as you feel you'll be more faithful to the original article, even if you don't know what they actually did because they didn't write that. And this, of course, will be uh, interpreted differently by, by different labs. But I think it's just actually interesting to see. So our attempt is just to have like a, an ecological attempt of having each lab do their best, take their best shot 
at performing a replication with, with what they had from the paper, right? But of course, we asked them to specify those things. So like, okay, the authors don't tell you the age, you, you can pick whatever age you want, but please tell us. So it did this very standardized form. So like people could inform uh, us on their methodological decisions and pre-register those in the protocol. But even if you do have information, it doesn't mean you can follow everything uh, strictly because sometimes not everything can be kept constant at the same time. So we, these are also our examples. So you can get like, like okay, so female with her rest three months old and weighing 150 to 200 grams were used throughout the studies. If you work with rats, you know that like three months old rats, unless you're, I mean, my three months old rats weigh much more than this, right? Uh, and for some reason, I think rats just got uh, heavier uh, over the last 20 years in Brazilian science. So like nobody could actually have this very light rats after three months. So we have to decide, I mean, are you going to keep the age constant? Are you going to keep the weight constant? Again, what's important, that really depends on your view of the experiment. Depending on the situation, you might want to go for one or for the other. Same thing, same, same, same goes for cells. So here we seeded cells for one, three, and five days, and we got 60, 80, or 100% confluence in these three times. So maybe, maybe in your hands, in your lab, uh, you take six or seven or nine days for cells to get to 100% confluence. So, like, are you, do you hold the confluence constant? Do you hold the time constant? That really depends on your understanding. And uh, again, I think that varies from person to person, from experiment to experiment. You have to make those calls. And again, you want to make those calls ahead of time before starting. Uh, and there's also articles that, I mean, there's just some stuff that cannot be true. And and, and you, you kind of like know the article is wrong because either it's ambiguous or it's very likely an error. These are two examples here from our sample as well. So here, both groups were kept in their diets for 13 weeks, and then we start behavioral studies. But then like uh, three or four paragraphs later, so like on day 15 of the experiment, so like it can't be 13 weeks and 15 days. One of these is certainly wrong. Uh, probably, I I'll guess the second one is a copy-paste error, but that's just my judgment. But if you're trying to replicate this based on the article, you have to decide whether it starts behavior on day uh, 80 something, 91 or day uh, 15. And again, uh, we left those to the labs. Some some stuff just seems wrong. So like this is a the, the reported primer for the CD90 pro uh, gene uh, in, again, in one of the blast this, uh, which is like, uh, 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 go to a big genome da database to see what, what this matches. This does not match anything that's close to CD90. So it's very likely uh, a, an error. Uh, somebody just like uh, pasted the wrong sequence here. That said, I don't really know if the authors actually uh, did this. I mean, used this primer originally and, and, and just like were measuring something else versus they actually used the right primer and just reported it wrong. And you have to make the call whether you keep the primer or change the primer. Uh, and again, if you keep the primary, you be following the protocol strictly. You're doing the direct replication of the reported methods, except you're not measuring CD90. So that's actually not very good as a, a replication of the of the claim in the article. So again, you have to pick whether you want to keep to the methods or actually keep to the reported finding. And again, people were will make different judgments on this depending on, on, on what's important for them. Uh, and I think that kind of comes down to replicating the protocol or the model's behavior. Uh, I think the, the, the cells example definitely does speak to this. Uh, this also happens in the cancer biology uh, 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 study and actually made some of their experiments, uh, some of their replications uninterpretable in their own words. So like this study was a, some kind of modification of tumor to make it grow faster. And in the original, the mice took more or less nine weeks to develop a tumor, but like when they tried it, like their controls got in a week. So it's impossible to see like something going faster because it was right going very fast. And then of course, I mean, you want to do a direct replication, you kind of had to end here and say, okay, this is non-interpretable non because uh, our controls work very differently. Or you can try to actually go ahead and okay, no, let's try to forget about following the recipe. We will like inject less tumor or less aggressive tumor or whatever, but we find a way in which our controls actually get tumors in nine weeks and then we can try to look at the original finding. And again, do you want to do this? Not sure, but uh, I think it's, an, it's a valid choice. So it's, it's kind of like... Uh, go, asking like uh, how much this is replicable in one shot. In that case, not very much because the controls act weird, but then again, you, you can't say much about the original finding versus 
how replicable this is with my best efforts. So like I tried this, it works. Oh, it doesn't work this way. So I can tweak the protocol as much as I want until I get, okay, this is what I think, but my, my ideal replication. And then let's look at this. Of course, you shouldn't base it on the, on, on the results, but uh, there's way to, but again, I think these two options are valid. And uh, depending on what you're interested in, you might be interested in, in, in just like doing it uh, exactly as, as it is in the paper versus adapting perhaps as much as possible if you really want to give the authors the benefit of the doubt and want to see if you can replicate this finding in some way. And then again, I, this, this goes a bit into the conceptual side. I mean, uh, the, the original paper might, might not be replicable as it is written, but perhaps the finding is valid. So I think the first answer is more the meta scientist answer. Okay, like how much of the literature can replicate versus this, the, 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 the second option is more of a, the, the person who is actually interested in the finding and wants to know if the claim is true, even if the article is, is, is not replicable as it is written. And of course, once you start doing it, you want to put up the extra rigor and be as rigorous as you can. Of course, that does not hold only for applications. I give the same advice to, to any experiment, but uh, uh, this, this makes it perhaps extra important because if you're doing a replication of a controversial finding, this might be called into question if you don't replicate the original results. So you want to be sure you're randomizing animals and blinding the experimenter uh, and definitely the outcome assessors. Uh, you want to have very explicit uh, criteria to include or not to include uh, data in the analysis. You want to control for the many biases that exist in lab science, such as batch effects, pseudo-randomization, uh, confounding or other confounders. Uh, you want to have adequate sample size. I'll talk more about this in a second. And you probably want to pre-register your protocol, uh, even if you don't publish it, but you should at least register it. And uh, you want to have as full documentation of experimental steps as you can. Of course, all of this recommendations hold for any experiment, but you definitely want to keep them uh, if you're doing a replication one. Uh, if you're calculating sample size, I think it's worth realizing that most sample sizes in the literature are very likely to be inflated. Uh, from publication bias alone. I mean, if you're publishing positive findings only uh, and you, you probably have random variation uh, around uh, the effect size. So like whenever you overestimate an effect size, you end up published. Whenever you underestimate an effect size, you end up not publishing. So that tends to make the literature systematically inflated. So uh, you you might want, I mean, you might base your, your sample size calculation on the original effect, but remember it's inflated, so you probably want to compensate it by for aiming at very high power, not like 80%, more like 95, 99%, because your, your, your sample size calculation is probably wrong from uh, the effect size inf to inflation to start with, and you definitely don't want to use an insufficient sample size here. You probably end up using a larger sample size than the original study. That's fine. That's actually very much... Uh, recommended. And okay, so I've been talking a lot about how you have to decide everything up front, but like I think my 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 greatest uh, the, the, what I learned of, of of most importance in the in, in in our projects is that you really can't do it. I mean, some stuff goes wrong as you go, and as much as you try to plan everything in advance, and we did try very hard to plan everything in advance, uh, some things will come up after experiments start. And uh, if you want to be very, very, very strict in pre-registering stuff, uh, that actually increases the chances that you actually have to break your plan. So uh, uh, there's a decision here of like, uh, whenever you pre uh, that, that goes right for any pre-registration, but there is a, 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 a decision between uh, being very precise and specifying everything you do and increasing the chances that you have to break this and this and this versus being a bit, bit more vague. But again, that opens up the possibility to, for, for bias if you leave many decisions open. And there's no easy answer for this, uh, I think. Uh, but again, I think you have to realize that protocol breaks and methodological problems within the experiment are inevitable, either because uh, there's, I mean, just the model works differently in your hands and you have to end up have to have more cells to, to actually grow this to this confluence. You end up uh, having to handle the animals for more time for them to learn the, the, whatever. So like I have to change the protocol to make this model work or because people just messed up or, or, I mean, stuff happens, right? I mean, per perhaps you left this uh, agitating for 35 minutes instead of 30. And if you just like, for any extra minute you throw the experiment away, you're going to be repeating this 
a lot of times. And of course, like people will make small breaks in the protocol and not even tell people about it uh, all the time. And of course, if you document this, if you document the experience well, you can actually like take a look and say, okay, you took 32 minutes instead of 30. But still, what do you do then? I mean, do you just like throw that away and 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 do it again and again and again until this is exactly 30? That's fine. But like at some point, sometimes I have to accept small deviations, right? And uh, I think like our major problem in the initiative, we did not really anticipate how much people will break their own protocols. I mean, we we put a lot of effort in 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 quality control uh, at the protocol stage, and then we just realized people don't follow this. I mean, they just change things sometimes for no no apparent reason i mean you know we just do it this way like well, why did you write it up that way but i mean that's another matter but like we did have to deal with a lot of protocol breaks of course we we're we we're not doing the studies like other labs were but it, it can be the same in your lab i mean a lot of people might be collaborating and they i mean one might register the other might execute uh things happen and and things happen and it's fine for things to happen because science is hard but it should be transparent that things are happening it should be uh, very clear about what changed if you're having this protocol breaks. And sometimes you have to decide uh, uh, post hoc, right? I mean, there was this very minor adaptation here, which likely does not invalidate the, invalidate the results. But who knows? How do you judge? Somebody has to judge it. And again, again, you have to judge it before the results come in, because after results come in, it's inevitably biased. I mean, you, you got the same results. People will say, yeah, this probably didn't matter. You got different results. People say, oh yeah, you changed this and this is super important. And of course, if you if, if you throw away your results only when you don't replicate the original finding, that definitely bias your, biases your replication for at the limit, always confirming because if it doesn't confirm, you always find something different. So I have to make this call. This is a valid replication before, ideally before you start. But like, again, things will happen in the beginning. So you probably have to do a second a second decision after the experiment, and this is what we did, and I think this worked well. So, like after the experiment's over, you have this and this and this and this small deviations from the protocol or big deviations sometimes, uh, and you have to get people together and before they look at the results, uh, decide on whether this should count as replication. So we did this. We got we we got all the documentation from every experiment. We summarized whatever we found uh, deviating from the, from the original protocol. We had a this or that, and we gave both the documentation without the results. And this post replication notes to three people who actually scored uh, the protocols. Okay, this did not change at all versus this changed to the point that it's not a replication anymore. And if any of the three people thought that this might not be valid, we discussed and we reached the consensus answer. And out of the 140 something experiments, I think like we 30 of them got uh, thrown out of the analysis at this stage, either because they had a protocol break or they had insufficient sample size or from some or or, or bad documentation. So like. Uh, we took this post-experiment quality control without looking at the results. I think it was very much worth it. And I think this can be applicable to actually other uh, settings beside replication. I think it could be somewhat of a routine in biomedical experiments because I think this gets you, uh, I mean, takes the, takes away the bias. I mean, it doesn't require you to specify a lot of things in advance. So it could be hard, but it still takes away the bias of like throwing away uh, uh, an experiment or not after you see the results, which is, uh, I think, to me, very, very harmful. But I think even then, uh, even trying to do this does not cover all the, 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 the problems because some problems only become apparent when you look at the results. So like you, you might look at the results and say, this is something fishy. I mean, all this is this a CT values for a PCR for a gene and you have 35, 35, 37, 35, and six and three. And pretty much everybody says, oh, this is just wrong, right? I mean, this is a threshold that was set in the wrong uh, place and it's just capturing noise. It's probably very low amplification. Uh, I mean, a PCR researcher would definitely tell. I mean, uh, uh, everybody we ask will say this, but uh, again, you can only make this calls after after seeing the results. And you, this one you can press pre specified, but it helps to have at least a, a set criteria for like, okay, if we have suspicious results, how do you deal with it? So we kind of like build a taxonomy for how to deal with this. Uh, sometimes you cannot measure the outcome. Sometimes you cannot measure the outcome in all samples. Sometimes a few samples. Sometimes it's very variable. So, but like we try to make a, a list of the situations and, and and try to be systematic. Like how we should deal with each one. I mean, sometimes you can repeat the whole experiment or just repeat the samples. Of, I mean, there's a, a kind of like a a, a a pipeline of how how you should proceed with each of these. Of course, you cannot anticipate. You cannot anticipate until you see the results, but you can try to have general categories and know how to deal with this. And again, I think we took a little, we were late in realizing we, we needed this. We, for, for the first cases, 
that happened. We kind of like did not have the the the, the right taxonomy. We had to stop and okay, let's try to build this and let's see if we're dealing with every case in the same way, which is probably important. And okay, so uh, done with experiments, you finally have to analyze data. And uh, of course, then there's a lot of choices as well, which you also want to pre-register. There's a lot of ways to define what counts as a, as a, as a successful replication. Again, you never get the exact same results. So there's always some kind of a threshold you have to set. Okay, this kind of like looks like the original versus if it's not, and it's not a dichotomous either. And you want to be fair to the original. I mean, of course, you're not getting the exact same result, but you, you want to see if you were kind of like in the same ballpark. And if this is still uh, plausible, if this one is true. Uh, and of course, for this, most people want to use more than one measure. I think most replication projects have done that. They uh, can look at whether you have uh, strong evidence of an effect in the same direction, if, irrespective of the effect size, it could be very much larger or smaller than the original, but it still goes the same way versus whether you have an effect size that's compatible with the original one, which again could be the first one is significant, the second one is not, and it is not analysis, but they're still compatible with each other. So this is kind of a bit different. And you probably want to look at more than one because they answer, they answer uh, slightly different questions. And I think uh, another important question in analysis, whether you want to actually take the original into the account, into account. So it could do a meta-analysis of both. And that's probably worth it if you're looking for evidence of an effect. I mean, I want to know if this effect is real. Your probable best measure is 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 to take both and, and, and synthesize them and do a meta-analysis and see what comes out. That said, uh, that's probably not very good for meta-science purposes. If you want to know the reproducibility rate of the literature, if you're always putting your original effect size within uh, your 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 analysis, then you're probably biasing it towards uh, confirming rather than than disproving the original findings. So uh, I, I, again, I think there's different options that you might want to take here. Uh, and of course, if you have many replications of the same experiment, the opportunities to analyze this in meaningful and interesting ways increase very 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 much. So uh, I'll definitely, I mean, if you can do, of course, doing a multi-center replication is very much more complex. In terms of, of coordinating people, it's, it's not just about your lab. You have to like uh, be coordinating stuff about multiple labs. And that's actually that can be very hard. That's like most of the work in a project. But that allows you to uh, actually take all your applications and actually look at interlab variation. Uh, and I, th I think that's the fairest way to see whether the original finding actually is, is win within the plausible range of variation, which would be the, perhaps the prediction interval. Of an of a meta analysis, for example, versus no, this seems to be something different because like we are all agreeing in this in this uh, in, in this area of the effect size, and like this is completely outside uh, what could be considered as a, 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 a likely effect given all effects. But of course, you can only do this when you have a, a lot of replications, and that takes a lot of effort. But again, I think you can do it; it's definitely worth it. And of course, uh, after this is just a primary analysis. So, like our primary analysis, like to see how reproducible is this particular piece uh, sample of the literature. But there's all kinds of interesting things you learn in the process, and there's all kinds of interesting you can analyze on a more exploratory way. And that includes your own difficulties, your own problem. Uh, again, the reproducibility project cancer biology has two papers. One is about the results. The second one comes out in the same issue of your life and it's pretty much almost decided and it might be more important, which says like how hard this was, what were our challenges, what were our obstacles, what we couldn't do. Uh, I think, I, again, my, after five years of this, my experience is definitely like the, the most important part of what I learned is like about our own difficulties and we're trying to actually measure that more systematically by doing a self-assessment of labs like what went wrong why did you deviate from the protocol what was hard about doing this protocol if you want to start over like what would you do differently i think there's like a lot to be learned in by looking at ourselves in the first person uh, uh, and i think you should definitely uh, as you start out you should probably be thinking of, of 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 looking at these things as well if you if you have a meta science uh, purpose in mind and of course, I think uh, putting out together, you just have to remember like basic uh, philosophy, uh, ethics, and 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 good conduct in science. Replication never the final word. Of course, uh, there's there's always a possibility that you get completely different results from some kind of small protocol break that nobody saw or anticipated or realized. Uh, and uh, we should never not not hold replication as uh, evidence of, of fraud, misconduct, whatever, although we should hold them as evidence that, okay, perhaps we should not trust this finding as much, 
this should not be about people unless you have a very good reason to suspect the people, but I think that's a completely different uh, subject. There's more to discrepancies than who's right and who's wrong. Perhaps both people can be right and, and we're just doing it differently. Uh, so it should be courts and kind and give the benefit of the doubt to the authors and to, um, unless again, we have very strong evidence to suspect that there, there is some kind of misconduct going on. And uh, so you should not assume that just because you could not replicate results, you have the right answer, but you should also not assume the opposite. I mean, just because you did not get the same results, I think, especially if you're not into this meta science business and you're doing a replication because you're trying to base your PhD project based on this and you don't get, I mean, my perception as, as a younger researcher is always like, I'm doing something wrong and the literature is right. And we should not assume that as well. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that should not write in the literature. It could, I mean, there's a very real possibility that actually like your your lack of effect is the right and like this actually never happened as it, as it is reported. So we shouldn't trust, I mean, we should give the benefit of the doubt both to the answer, to the authors and to us. I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's not gonna be clear who's right or if, if there is somebody right and somebody wrong. And uh, I think you should not be afraid of the consequences of replicating and publishing replications. Uh, there's, I mean, people are very much scared of backlash in science. That can happen. I think that exists. Uh, but uh, sometimes those fears could be overrated. I think there's a, a reasonably large community that's uh, into meta meta research that understand reproducibility problems and will give you support if you have to to go up against somebody that, that's bigger than you. And I, I think people realize that there are problems. I mean, if you, if you do it the right way and you approach people courteously and you're not uh, pointing fingers, or, or if you're better, better yet, you're pointing fingers at yourself, like at, at us, at a scientific community. Uh, I don't think you get that much backlash as you would expect. I mean, our project has always been seen in a favorable light in 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 Brazil at least. Of course, we have not published the results yet. Maybe like when we do publish the results, people will, will start complaining. But like up to us, to us, it's been a first person effort. I mean, it's like Brazilian lines, Brazilian researchers looking at Brazilian science and the more the project evolved, the more it became a first person thing because we realized like, okay, we're trying to look at the literature, but we have a lot of trouble like doing things right as well. So like we, we it went very much in the self-assessment direction. So I think it's, I mean, we should think of this as, as learning together and uh, this is how science should, should work in my, my view. And uh, just doing this replication, big replication project has definitely made me much more, uh, more uh, made, made, made me believe much more in that uh, in that mantra uh and this is about it i mean so like again the project is not finished we should we, we have results so we're analyzing them we should have them published hopefully by the end by the end of the year perhaps uh, but we do have uh, some articles uh, describing the method and describing uh, some uh, difficulties in in running the project we do have a website uh, nosf with, with uh, a lot of the protocols and and and, and and not the data yet, but but with with a lot of what we did, and uh, this is the organizing team in the in the initiative, and they have been definitely with me, uh, either from the start or at, at some points in time. But we've been learning very much about this together. Uh, we realized we had uh, the, last week we counted our internal meetings. We had like two hundred and fifty something internal meetings, so like more than half a month of continuous time together discussing about the project. And uh, this has been a fascinating experiment for me. And hopefully if you try to do your applications, you'll learn as much as we have learned in this process. And this is it. Uh, thank you and I'm open for questions here.